So if I start out my animation and I just have simple ball I'm going to just fill it with some color. Now keep in mind when you are drawing shapes. So if I draw a shape and I get close but don't quite close it and then grab the paint bucket and try to fill that with color and nothing happens. We can close gaps. So I can choose large gap and that allowed it. I can manually choose the kind of gap if I choose no gap when I'm trying to go see there's color there. Now if I get rid of the color and try and fill with the paint bucket, nothing happens. So if you're trying to fill your shape and nothing is happening, chances are your gap is too big for the paint bucket settings and you do need to then change it to a different setting. Now that's just a little side point. So with the circle drawn, if I want to animate the circle across the screen, I mean one thing that I could do is I could extend out the exposure and remember the plus key will extend exposure for this and I can now click in that next drawing and I can even say duplicate so then that so I'm using the duplicate drawing option. If I look at my timeline, I see there's two squares there. So I have the first drawing, the second drawing, and now I can take that drawing and I can move that drawing over a little bit. So we can do that and that maintains consistency of artwork, but that is gonna be a lot of work. Now you can certainly work that way, but what we're going to also look at is another option. So inside of Harmony, because it does support cutout style animation, it has pegs. And these pegs are additional layer information that we add to our drawing layers. And we can have multiple pegs for a drawing layer. So we can have a peg that controls our position on screen. We can have a peg that controls our rotation, peg that controls our scaling. So we can have lots of different things and it can get really, really complex. But in the beginning, we're just going to keep it simple. So I'm going to take my layer and I'm going to click out at the end of my timeline and I will use the function key F5 to extend my exposure. Now I can also right click here at this point and we can choose extend exposure. We see it does say F5 there. So just remember that is function key F5 that extends it out so that it exists. Okay. So now there's really no change in what we've done here, except that we have one drawing existing for all 60 frames. But what I want to have happen is I want to be able to animate this using a peg layer. And to do that with my drawing layer selected, I can now click on the add peg icon. So it's right next to the add drawing layer icon, we have add peg. If I click on the plus, we'll see that it's on that option as well and we do have command P as an option. So with this layer selected, if I hit command P, it's going to give me an error on that. And there's some nuances that we have to keep track of, which is why we typically don't do it. Where that does work properly is when we start working in what is called our node view. So we have nodes that are part of our project and we can see how these nodes set everything up, but we're not going to, at this point in our animation journey, we're not gonna care about the nodes. What we're going to do is just care about the layers, and I'm going to add a peg to this layer. Now you'll notice how that peg is effectively apparent, where our artwork layer is indented from that. We have this little arrow that I can collapse on it, and now we see there's a peg. It also has a different icon, the icon has the two dots with the curving line between it versus the triangle circle square icon. So it makes it a little bit different. Now, pegs allow us to do keyframe animation. So I can establish a keyframe which sets all of the different information for this layer. So we can set our position, we can set angle or rotation, we can scale, skew, all of these things. So we have lots of options that we can work with but we typically 
don't enter the numbers in there. We just click at the first frame and we have to insert a keyframe. You'll notice in the timeline, there's the little KF icon here. We can click on that to insert a keyframe. The tooltip tells us that function key F6. So remember we used F5 to extend our exposure. F6 is going to allow us to insert a keyframe. Now that puts a little dot here. Now it's important when we're doing keyframe animation that we collapse on the peg layer. So we click the little arrow so we don't see our drawing layer in the timeline. We just simply see the peg layer. Now what I can do further out in time, so I'm just going to go out, say one second. So I'll go over to, whoop, one frame too many, to frame 24 here. And when we animate, actually before we start animating, what we do need to do is we need to set our pivot point. The pivot point is that point at which our animation is going to move, rotate, etc. And by default, that pivot point is in the middle of our camera view. So we'll see there is that pivot point. So if I rotate, you can see it's rotating around that pivot point that's in the middle. So we have to set the pivot point. And the proper way to set the pivot point is to use our advanced animation rotate tool. Typically that is going to be at the top of your screen. If you don't see that, go under window toolbars and choose advanced animation. But if you have the default workspace, it will be at the top center of the screen. We use the rotate tool. And then once that happens, we don't click and rotate, but instead what we're going to do is move our cursor over the blue dot, and you'll see where it gives us two, the kind of crosshairs plus a little P next to it. And then I can click and drag that. In this case, I'm going to just drag it to the center. Now if I wanted it to rotate around its bottom here, I could do that, and we could see how it's now rotating around the bottom but if I want it to rotate around the middle, translate from the middle, scale, skew, etc. So it's not uncommon if you're doing character animation that you may move pivot points periodically to adjust where something moves or scales from for dramatic effect or emotional effect. So now I've established that. Now all of our animation happens underneath the little running man using the transform tool. That is how we actually transform our artwork when we are animated. So now let's go back to frame 24. And if I move this to a new location, we'll see we get this little line in our timeline. That line indicates that we are tweening or animating this across. Now you will notice this was a much faster way than just drawing 24 versions of our circle across the screen or duplicating it, moving it, duplicating it, and moving it. And the best part about this is if I decide, oh, I don't want to go that far, I only want to go this far, well now it's adjusted. So that is now, we're taking one second and we're animating a specific distance. Another fun part about this is now, let's say here I am in the middle and if I move this up here, it automatically now inserts a new keyframe. And you can see how it's now following that path. And now I, if I go here, insert a different keyframe, I could make it move horizontally, then it goes up and comes down. So we have options while we're animating, which are really fun and arguably a lot easier. Now I could go at this point with this keyframe and decide that as this goes up in the air, I want it to rotate. So I just move by a corner, get the little round, and you'll see how it's now rotating, which if I go back to my artwork layer, and I'll just grab the paintbrush, I'm just going to grab red, and I'm just going to put an arrow on this so we can better see, now go back to my animation tool. Now, one thing I didn't mention when we're using the animation tool is we always want to be animating on the peg, and Notice how when I click on a peg layer, it frames it in yellow and gives it a yellow overlay. If I click on my artwork layer, it frames it in magenta and gives it a magenta overlay. So if you see magenta overlay and magenta frame, you have selected with the transform tool, the drawing layer. But we want to choose the peg layer so it's yellow. And this isn't going to be super critical at this point 
when you're just beginning out. But when you start building more complex animations where you're having complex rigged characters and environments, it is going to matter. So it's just good to get in that habit. And one way that you can make that easier on yourself is with the transform tool active, we go up into our tool options and we choose this icon right here, which is peg selection mode. So what that means is any drawing layer that has a peg associated with it, when you click on that drawing layer, it will automatically select the peg. So you don't have to go and try and find and make sure you're selecting that peg. And again, when we have sync, you know, one drawing layer combined with one peg, it's not a big deal, but it's a good practice to get into. So we always select peg selection mode when we're animating. We use the transform tool to animate. We use our rotate tool to set that pivot point at which it's going to animate. Once you set it, you don't change it again in your project. If you do, it will change everything across your entire timeline. So if you use the rotate tool to rotate something, it's going to mess up your whole timeline. So just don't do it. So we can see how it inserts keyframes for us. You can see how it rotated. And because this keyframe was made before I rotated it, it doesn't share that information. If I expand this, we can even look at what is happening in the timeline. So I can see as I move across the path, and now we can see how our rotation is changing. So we were starting out at zero and our rotation goes to minus 91.8586. And then it's going to rotate back to zero. So if I want to rotate this so it matches what was happening there or we're across and now we can point down so we can see and maybe on this first frame just for kicks I'll make it horizontal and to just pull it down so I hope what you're realizing is this is a lot more flexible and gives you a lot more options while you're animating allowing you to do things a little bit faster and a little bit easier. So right now we're doing basic tweened animation. Now from this point at the apex of our little jump, I'm going to extend this up higher. So we have a little more space so we can see it goes up and it comes down. And now as it comes down, if I turn on onion skinning here, we're going to see from here to here that it's moving a linear amount. So from this frame to this frame, we have fixed timing. But we can certainly adjust that because I can go into my timing. And this is where having tweening can be really useful as I can use the tweening as a way to generate in between frames. So now at this point I can hit F6 or use the keyframe button. And now I can take this keyframe here and I can move it over. So it takes more frames to start the fall and then it falls faster. I'm even going to rotate this a little bit more here so we that rotate happens. So then as it's falling, it just goes down. So now if I play, you can see how I've adjusted some of my velocity, my spacing across the drawing. So now there's more, takes more frames to cover a small distance and now we cover the remaining distance very quickly. And if I want to adjust that even more, make it more dramatic. So now if we play, we'll see how it just goes and stabs into that ground very quickly. I'm going to just pull that back one frame because it's really just a little bit too fast. Just put a stop in here so we can see what is happening. Try again. There we go. So we can see it goes up and comes down, goes up and it comes down very quickly. Now we could change that and 
bring that so it goes very quickly and then falls slower at the end. And we could even shorten that a little bit more. I could decide that I want it right here so that happens very quick and then it slows way down. So how we adjust that spacing along with timing is how we start to imbue the things that you're animating with character, with life. They start to look like they may have mass or weight to them. Do they fall slowly? Do they move slowly? Are they fast? Are they bouncy? What happens? Now as we do this, I'm just going to adjust it back in the other direction. So it starts slow. Now I like where that is, but this frame right here, I'm just going to adjust that because I don't like the, I want the rotate to start to happen. But keep in mind as we work with things. So now if I extend this out, let's see, so I, I can stretch it. Now, a little tip here is when you're doing stretches, if you know you want to stretch it, first stretch it. So, because I want the arrow to stretch kind of correctly. I'll click, whoop, wrong key. Click off it, but now you can see how that bounding box is aligned with it. So now I can stretch it how I want it to go. I'm going to just make it a little skinnier through here. And then I'll go back and set the rotation on it. So you'll see as it rotates, oh wow, we got to fix that. I, that's kind of ugly from here. We really do need an in-between frame. So I'm going to, actually before I do that, let's get that arrow pointing up, click off it, click back on, stretch it, make it skinnier, and then rotate it. You can see how now it starts to float up, stretches its way down. I'm just going to put that even a little closer to the ground. And now we can hit play. So our keyframes as we work with them give us a lot of flexibility. So even though we're using the same artwork, I'm not even changing drawings here, but I've created variety within them through a little bit of stretch. I haven't even added in any squash yet where often when it hits the ground, what I may want to have happen is now after it hit the ground, I'm going to go over two more frames and I'm going to stretch it out a little bit and pull it down, put it on the ground. Now I don't want to, I don't want to stretch this one because it doesn't make sense as it comes down for it to start getting horizontal. It needs to start stretching horizontally once it hits the ground. So it's very common in tweened animation, people on this frame, they stretch it out. And you can see in the onion skinning how it's getting wider as it hits the ground. And yeah, we'll even you know, kind of mimic what that next frame is. And it, that doesn't make sense for something to be stretching. It needs to have that force of hitting the ground affect it. So as we come down from here, it hits the ground, and then it can start stretching out. It can start stretching out, and then I just want to return it to its original form. Now if I've really messed things up, and I can't quite get it to its original form. There's a couple of ways that we could go about doing that. I mean, I can just kind of guess, but I can even just go back to the original shape that I have here, and I can now copy a peg. I can go to, so this is, it stretches, and now I want to go back to normal, so I'm going to paste in the original peg and then move that over so that now has the exact 
kind of height and width of the original. Oh wait, we came in arrow first, so it should be in that direction. Get it vertical. So I can copy paste keyframes as much as I want, and that's something that happens quite a bit when you start doing character animation, is you will copy and paste the keyframe. So you can see how we've now added in a little bit of bounce. Oh, the one is like, why is this going so slow? I, somehow I ended up on the wrong um, frame rate. This is where being in a live class is useful because students will always point that out when you're demoing in front of a live audience. They'll be like, hey, are you aware? And you're like, oh, no, I wasn't, but thank you. So it's useful that way. So you can see I can use keyframes to animate something without having to redraw every single frame. And that is a fantastic way to start expanding your repertoire. And then as you look at timing and spacing, how you adjust things, you can really get some amazing effects. Now that we have some understanding of working with keyframes, just going to take a quick look at how we can also work with drawing layers. So if I have a drawing layer, and on this drawing, I have, I'm going to just make a series of kind of scribble sorts of things. So now if we play this, let's see how it now plays through. And I'm going to I'm going to just add some fills in here. And turn up on your skinny, don't really need to see that. Uh, just trying to be quick. If you drag across the paint bucket will fill across everything. So now I have a little basic sequence here. Now I can take this sequence and if I highlight it what I can do is ex I can create a cycle with this and I can choose how many cycles. So it's six or seven frames. So we'll do seven times eight. Oh, wait, sorry, I should have. Let's try the math again. Seven times nine and it goes all the way out. So create cycle. If I extend my project, we'll see it goes for the full 63 frames. But we'll just leave the, it at that. And now if I play, we'll just see how it keeps repeating. So as it cycles repeating, that works okay. Now I can take the same layer and add a peg to it. And exactly how did with the ball. I'm going to collapse that. Go grab my transform tool. Well, before the transform tool, go grab my rotate tool. Now grab the transform tool to start animating. Function key F6 to insert a keyframe. So we have this here. Turn on the other layer just so I can see what's going on and I'm just going to start this behind it 
Now this, I'm just going to put it up here. So we can see you can have a sequence continuing. Now if I didn't want that sequence to continue and just wanted it to end, well we'll have it go through and follow when it hits the ground. You can see how it's following and it just plays through. So we can have an animated sequence happening with it. But we can also combine this. Let's just even get rid of the keyframes there. And that's the keyframe where it hits the ground. So what I'm going to do is just actually we'll just where it hits the ground move this over to here so it's hitting the ground delete those frames so I just highlight and delete so they go away now it hits and I get my frames of the animation but as it hit the ground what I'm going to do is just take through these couple frames here and shrink it up so it shrinks and decide I don't really need those extra frames extend out my scene there just so we can see so I animated a sequence but now that sequence is compressing and I think what I want is I'm going to just move that so it's more on the ground so it's almost like as it hit the ground if we need it to go faster speed it up so it takes fewer frames for that to happen can so maybe I didn't need all seven frames so we're combining together frame by frame drawing and keyframing though the scale of it instead of drawing the scale smaller I just animated that down through tweening and keyframes so when you work with keyframes, they're really powerful items that we can do a lot of creative things. So good luck and have fun animating.